So our next, our first speaker that kicks off Summer Strong, um, this is a guy that I've been following for years, has a big name in the industry, and it's kind of cool because it seems like Summer Strong pulls all types of different people, and, and a few years ago, uh, I think I was sitting with Derek Woodski, and he goes, hey, did you just see Stan Everding walk by? And I go, yeah, I did. I thought I, that was him, right? big deal and I was like where'd he go and we look around I'm like hey he's gone a couple other people like no no Stan was here earlier and I was like he never said he was coming he just kind of popped in it's like super cool so we had we've struck up a friendship I asked him to do it this year he said of course he's always been a, a huge resource for us and so I think it's cool when experts they come here to get fed as well and on his own volition he decided to come here see what it was all about but then was very gracious to come here and share uh, his story and his expertise with us. So I'll let him take it from here, but our first presenter, Stan Efforting. Thank you, brother. Okay, I'm mic'd up. Everybody hear me okay? We all good down there? Actually, I was doing a seminar about an hour down the street a few years ago, and uh, I heard there was free food over here, so I drove down, I ate the free food, and I split, didn't say anything to anybody, but uh, it's great to be back. I, uh, I've done over 200 seminars in 14 countries in all 50 states. I still get really nervous about the seminars because uh, I, I want to give good information, and it's so hard to do now with all the information that's out there. And I want people to have something that they can take away, that they can use uh, things that I've learned over, you know, over a 30-plus year career. I started competing in 1986. Um, <clears throat> before I get started, though, am I the only lifetime natty in this group? Is Michael Hearns not here today? I'm, I'm the single only lifetime natty in the group. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is what I call like risk mitigation strategies for competitive athletes. It's more like exceeding your genetic potential and living to tell about it. And I think it's odd coming from a guy like me, uh, after the way I abused myself for 30 years of competing, they say there's no bigger prude than a reformed prostitute, so I present myself here for you today in that, in that regard. Uh, but I learned a lot, and uh, I've watched too many uh, friends and familiar people in the industry uh, not heed some of these warnings in their pursuit of excellence or their, their fitness careers, and we've seen them pass, unfortunately, at a young age. And so... Uh, what we're going to talk about today is some of the things that I do to help uh, to have helped myself live to tell about it and a lot of the athletes that I've worked with over the years. Uh, let me see if I can get, a, get this to advance. You guys are familiar with me, University of Oregon, exercise science, uh, over 30 years of, of uh, competing. Uh, I also partnered with Dr. Damon McCune. He's a uh, uh, well, we're going to talk about the vertical diet today. You guys, th this is kind of a book that I put out. It's the culmination of everything I've learned throughout my career that I want my clients to know. Questions people have asked me, uh, and it's not just a diet. It's everything from sleep and hydration, nutrition, digestion, uh, blood uh, work, all that kind of stuff. We're going to go through that today. And then, uh, you know, my meal prep company, uh, uh, I send monster mashes to people all over the country to their front door. Uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of how I uh, you know, support myself in this business. Here's Dr. Damon McCune. He's a, R, uh, a PhD, RDN, was director of dietetics at UNLV. And some years ago when I wanted to uh, start coaching at a, you know, at a, at a public level, uh, as opposed to just individually with clients, I wanted to make sure, again, that the information I provided was scientifically accurate. So uh, I partnered with Damon. We spent hundreds of hours together going over all the information that we provided and attaching uh, over 200 references to peer-reviewed published research, and just to make sure that, that we were, you know, in the right uh, uh, science-based space. I'm in a little trouble with the advancer here. Is that working for me? Do I need to point this somewhere in particular? Uh, we started Biggs University. Uh, ben Pollock, of all people, IFBB Pro, world record powerlifter, moved to Las Vegas. We connected. Now I'm hosting seminars at my house and my gym there. We invite people from all over the country to come. Uh, and Biggs University has been kind of an exciting new thing. That was Ben. Uh, ben was right there. Now, I've worked with a lot of great athletes over the years. You guys might recognize some of these folks. <laughs> Not sure if the sound's working on that, but uh, uh, there we go. Okay. 
More recently, I had the opportunity to spend uh, nearly a year working with John Jones to get him fattened up for his uh, UFC heavyweight uh, bout, his debut as a heavyweight. Uh, that was an exciting win. And then uh, uh, Henry Cejudo uh, just fought a real close one. It was hard to lose, a split decision, five-round uh, championship fight just a couple weeks ago. And now I'm working with the uh, U.S. Women's Olympic wrestling team. So it, it's a lot of variety. Uh, a lot of people have different needs, whether it's strength training or nutrition. Uh, but it's great to be involved with these folks. We wear it as a badge of honor, of course. We work with a great athlete. But the fact of the matter is they're the easiest people to train. They're the most genetically gifted. They're the hardest working, the most disciplined, uh, the most consistent. Uh, it, it's the gen pop where we struggle uh, with. Uh, and we've had a lot of success with those folks as well. But the recidivism is, is uh, it, it's, it's hard to swallow sometimes. Uh, let's see if we can get this to advance here. Uh, I can't talk about physical health without talking about mental health. You guys are familiar with these very famous athletes who have uh, come out and spoken about their challenges with depression and anxiety. Uh, had the opportunity to work with Lane Johnson, of course, for a number of years now. Uh, middle of the season, had to miss two games to seek psychiatric help uh, for, for depression. If guys like this can come out and talk about their challenges, then certainly anyone here should feel welcome to do so as well. Uh, please talk to someone if you're having these challenges where the mind goes, the body will follow. You're, you're welcome to talk. Uh, uh, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to me or a professional in the industry, but please uh, talk about it. Your mental health is very important. Uh, I've said many times that uh, health and fitness are not the same thing. If you want to be healthy, don't compete. Uh, I understand what uh, people go through and put themselves through in order to compete at a high level. I've said that fitness is the... Uh, get this... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, hit me. There we go. There it is, there's backwards. Fitness, the ability to perform a particular duty or task. The fitness level required to be a world's strongest man uh, or a UFC champion or a 14-year-old gymnast in the Olympics is not necessarily healthy. That includes 10-year-old badminton players in China blowing out lateral collateral ligaments. You know, the things we put ourselves through to achieve the level of fitness that we want or desire uh, is going to be unhealthy. Uh, sometimes it can be, you know, mechanically and sometimes it can be, uh, you know, physiologically with a, a whole lot of uh, problems that occur with people like gaining too much weight. And uh, so a lot of what I do is risk mitigation. Um, and first and foremost, genetics reign supreme. We know this in terms of performance. Uh, the, the greatest athletes tend to have been gifted to something that many of us were not. Uh, but it's also the same is true in terms of health. Some people have a, a higher predisposition for blood pressure or lipids or any other uh, cancer included. There's a whole host of things that uh, people just from their genetic predisposition may experience. A lot of side effects associated with uh, uh, competing or performance enhancing drugs or uh, either one. Uh, men in particular you know, will suffer from a whole host of uh, of uh, things like acne, oily skin, hair loss, water retention, gynecomastia, but women as well. Uh, and these aren't necessarily just uh, uh, people who are using performance enhancing drugs. We see a lot of this just in high school kids as well with their hormone fluctuations. And a lot of things that uh, women put them through when they're, themselves through when they're competing, uh, we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, with respect to acne, this is uh, uh, 
uh, what's called Accutane. You guys are familiar with this. This can be psychologically a huge thing for high school kids. And historically, they would go in and get therapeutic doses, like 100 milligrams a day. Uh, it's usually, I think it's a milligram per kilogram of body weight. But even one milligram or five milligrams is extremely effective, just as effective as the 100 milligram dose in terms of the symptoms, maybe not in terms of the, the accumulation needed for long-term care, but that's a more detailed conversation. Uh, but extremely effective, very low side effects. This is something that I turned Larry Wills on to many years ago. You might remember he had really bad cystic acne problems, completely cured him of that. He's talked about it many times publicly on his uh, podcast. Uh, Ten skin is the other thing cosmetically for people who shave and, and the like. This is a salicylic acid, uh, acetosilic acid. It's an aspirin. Very effective for people to manage those cosmetic concerns with acne, both men and women. Uh, hair loss, obviously, I've experienced a little bit of that myself throughout my career. Uh, genetics is uh, the primary driver. If your mother's brother has hair loss, you're probably going to have some receding hair. Uh, people will microdose their testosterone usage to limit that uh, and manage DHT and maybe use things like minoxidil or the like. But uh, generally speaking, it's, it's going to be a genetic predisposition. Gynecomastia is another big problem, uh, and some of this is genetic as well, particularly in high school kids. There's not a lot you can do about it, to be honest. This is something that probably needs surgical intervention. Uh, some people were mega-dosing um, uh, anti-estrogens, but that has a whole host of uh, adverse effects as well. So uh, we recommend microdosing uh, or uh, maybe surgery is going to be necessary in that regard. A lot of side effects uh, amongst athletes. Some of the th things that I manage for myself and for clients, high blood pressure, I look at the kidney health, liver health, dyslipidemia, which would be your high uh, cholesterol, insulin sensitivity, um, you know, type 2 diabetes and the like, and, and fatty liver disease. Uh, libido, obviously, is a, is a huge concern. Uh, fertility and thyroid function. So these are some of the things that I address with blood testing. Uh, metabolic syndrome is, is a common problem. It's our good friend Mark Bell when he was 330 pounds. And he and myself when I was over 30 pounds and, or 300 pounds and many of my athletes have these very same problems. High blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, fatty liver. Very common, particularly in the, the heavy bodybuilders, powerlifters, and strongmen. And even in a lot of the football linemen that I work with, uh, they ha have those problems. The big rocks for resolution are going to be really simple. It's very basic. Uh, it's going to be weight loss, although not everybody's interested in losing weight. That can have an effect on your performance and strength if you're a big athlete. So sometimes we have to mitigate th uh, that, get some, get some results without losing weight. Obviously, sleep uh, and blood pressure, these are the ones that are, that are huge. Uh, the, the biggest thing is going to be weight loss. I, I was on Tom Bilyeu's podcast, and I talked about this recently, and it just went viral, and people lost their shit, but here it is. The McDonald's diet. The guy went ate at McDonald's, had his students track everything. 1,850 calories a day. They measured everything that he ate, but everything he ate was off the McDonald's menu. Big Macs, fries, uh, ice cream, whatever fit. And he walked for 40 minutes a day. He lost 30 pounds. His blood pressure improved. His blood sugars improved. His cholesterol improved. All of those things improved simply from the weight loss itself. 95% of the health benefits that you'll realize are strictly from the weight loss itself, irrespective of the diet. All diets work when they're strictly adhered to. If you're in a caloric deficit. And they all work the same way. There's no all-you-can-eat diet. Whether you're keto, whether you're intermittent fasting, whether you're paleo, whether you're vertical, they all work for the same reason. You're in a calorie deficit. 95% of health benefits are strictly from weight loss itself. People just went apeshit on that. Like I was, what, what they cut off in that video was the fact that my very next sentence was, I would never recommend a McDonald's diet. <laughs> that never gets, it gets out on, on Instagram. So here's Dr. Ids. Don't know if you're following him, Dr. IDZ. This guy's awesome, MD, PhD. Uh, somebody in response to my video was making this claim and he came in and said the same thing I said. Losing weight in and of itself does nothing for your health. This is simply incorrect. School. It is simply false to say weight loss does nothing in and of itself. For example, we know keto diets are low in fiber and grains with beneficial phytochemicals and high in saturated fat and cholesterol. Basically, all things that credible health professionals don't advise doing for your health. However, this meta-analysis of 14 studies found the keto diet improves glycemic and lipid markers in people with type 2 diabetes because of the weight loss it induces. The actual benefits of losing excess adipose tissue still exist beyond those lifestyle changes. As shown in this review of over 500 studies, using Mendelian randomization found obesity to be causal in stroke, heart disease, and pulmonary embolisms. So yes, making positive lifestyle change should be the focus, but losing the actual fat tissue also improves your health. Glass is best. Yeah, he's great. There's a lot of stuff. Lane Norton said the same thing. Losing weight may be the best thing you can do for your health. 
Uh, weight loss consistently shows improvement in insulin resistance, cholesterol, cardiovascular disease risk, inflammation. I mean, we all know this, and that, that's going to be our primary driver. And this has been studied extensively, and, and again, the, the conclusion by the authors of these randomized controlled trials, 90 to 99% of health benefits are completely due to the weight loss itself. That should be our primary focus as an intervention for people who are suffering from any of these things, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and the like. And the best way to, for weight loss, really, the number one reason people don't lose weight is because they're hungry. That's it. And uh, so we work a lot on satiety when I design diets. One of the wrestlers for the women's Olympic team needs to lose weight. Another one needed to gain weight. And I have different strategies I'll talk to you about to do that. But as far as weight loss, uh, we just focus on satiety. Meal prep is, is kind of the number one thing. That's what bodybuilder figure physique bikini girls have been doing for decades. They carry around their little Tupperwares and their six-pack bags, and they're successful with weight loss as a result because everything's tracked and it's consistent and they don't deviate from their plan. Increasing meal frequency, increasing protein, using high satiety foods. Boiled potatoes and oranges are, are way up at the highest satiety foods on the satiety index that measures how long people stay full after eating certain foods. So we implement those with diet plans. Eat, drinking water with meals or even diet soda or iced tea, just, just consuming a lot of fluids right before a meal help you limit the number of total calories you consume. Um, increasing fiber, ridding the house of snacks, but finding low-calorie replacements so that you're not apt to go out and, 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 and get those snacks. That's huge, and we set our clients up with a list of those things. And then getting enough walks in every day can also help with, uh, with satiety. Uh, we know this, that hunger is the most important thing because we now have these medications many of you have heard of. They're uh, talked about all over social media now, this, uh, of the semaglutide variety. Uh, and these, they simply uh, make you not hungry. That's it. And they're very effective at doing that. They don't increase your metabolism or burn calories. Uh, and the long-term studies show the difference here. The group at the top is, uh, is the control group. And long-term weight loss over a period of two years uh, in the control group was around 2 to 4%. It's not a very good statistic. It's a hard industry to be a personal trainer and, and to, to help people with weight loss, knowing that the sex rate, success rates are so small and the recidivism is so high. Here we are with semaglutide, and that's with no particular intervention other than taking the semaglutide. Uh, in terms of dietary education, etc., they're up to 16 plus 18 percent uh, weight loss adherence after two years. Uh, it, it, it's hard to, to be a guy selling a diet and knowing that you get your ass kicked by semaglutide every day of the week. That doesn't matter what the diet is. Uh, the medical interventions are extraordinary and uh, potentially necessary for people who are struggling with weight loss and have a host of those uh, problems that uh, we talked about. So one of the things that I've been talking about for years, a term I coined some time ago, is called compliance is the science. I think a lot of the, what we talk about now is, is probably 1% information. I could write out a diet on a 3 by 5 card in a matter of minutes at a, uh, and, and hand it to someone. Uh, and it would be mostly agreeable by the academics and the, the nutritional uh, PhDs in the industry that, you know, eat more uh, whole foods, less ultra-processed foods, eat a little more protein and fiber, blah, blah, blah. You're, that's about all you can do, really. That's, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, but adhering to that diet, we say it's 1% information, 99% execution. Uh, that's where we try and focus all of our attention, is trying to create the kind of lifestyle habits that are able people to comply. I was talking with a high school coach uh, this weekend, who's that's one of the biggest challenges with his high school students, is that they just don't adhere to the diet. They don't, uh, whether they're trying to gain weight or lose weight, they, they just they leave the house in the morning and it's a free for all. You know, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. They just don't have a plan in place and don't uh, know how to comply. Biggest thing I work with with my athletes, and I tell you, I am shocked. Uh, with the number of people who get poor sleep, and we're probably all guilty of that, uh, whether it's uh, you know surfing social media too late at night, burning the candle at both ends, get too busy. Uh, the importance of sleep is extraordinary. Here's Dr. Joe Rogan, uh, or Dr. Joe Rogan. <laughs> Far from Dr. Joe Rogan. Uh, Joe Rogan talking to Dr. Matthew Wong about the importance of sleep. Practice does not make perfect. Practice with a night of sleep is what makes perfect because you come back the next day and you're 20 to 30% better in terms of your skilled performance than where you were at the end of your practice session the day before. Sleep is the greatest legal performance enhancing drug. If you're getting six hours of sleep or less, your time to physical exhaustion drops by up to 30%. So you could spend all of your time training for a 10 round fight 
perfect condition, but then I put you on six hours of sleep the night before, you're now going to be physically exhausted by round seven rather than round 10. Your peak muscle strength, your physical vertical jump height, and your peak running speed, all of those things correlate with sleep. The less that you have, the worse those outcomes are. And it's a perfect linear relationship. The less sleep that you have, higher your injury risk. So obviously, sleep's important. Increased sleep uh, increases testosterone growth hormone, improves blood circulation, decreases blood pressure to a significant degree, probably one of the most important contributors along with weight loss. Uh, lack of sleep slows metabolism, decreases testosterone and thyroid, increases stress and hunger, cortisol, and promotes insulin resistance. Uh, another big problem that I get with a lot of big athletes ever since 1993 uh, I've suffered from some degree of sleep apnea. As soon as my weight got north of 240, uh, I started waking up tired and snoring. Uh, and that is very common. I'm always shocked. When I worked with Hofthor, he did not wear a CPAP. Snored like a freight train. Went up and stayed with him in Iceland. Oh, my God. And so I always ask the wives or the girlfriends, do they snore? And they're like, does he snore? I mean, it, it's outrageous. And they don't wear CPAPs. Dan Green wasn't wearing a CPAP. Uh, uh, Brian Shaw wasn't wearing a CPAP. Shocking to me because I know how that feels to wake up in the morning and be falling asleep on the way to work in the morning, driving your car. It's because you held your breath all night and the effects that that has on your health. All of these things, fatigue, increased DOMS, brain fog, sore throat, headaches, uh, erectile dysfunction, blood thickness, Sodium loss, all of these things occur. So one of the first things I do is I encourage them to get a CPAP. And if you don't have the resources or a medical professional, a lot of times this is the problem internationally when I get folks from Canada with socialized medicine or Australia or Europe. Uh, it takes them a long time to get into a doctor. And even then, if it's only... Uh, if it's not severe apnea, then they just recommend weight loss because they don't want to fork out the two grand for a CPAP. Uh, well, you can get these things online at Craigslist for 400 bucks. I've got a reseller that'll help you. Uh, I think it's important enough that I, I put this in here, probably much to the chagrin of the medical community, uh, that we'd bypass their $2,000 recommendation and a $1,500 sleep test. If you can't afford it, it's very important. So uh, I do recommend this one of the first interventions that I start with with clients, and it's life-changing. And I've been in this business for 30 years. You won't hear me say that word a lot, life-changing. I don't get all excited about uh, little, uh, little tips and tricks and hacks. I just, I'm just not that guy. Uh, but with the CPAP, you wake up the next morning and you're mowing the lawn and cleaning the gutters and painting the house and you just have this whole renewed uh, energy. It feels fantastic. I also focus on sleep hygiene. These are some of the things most of you probably already know that, that really help with sleep, that scientifically support uh, improved sleep. Waking up the same time every morning, getting exposed to sunlight. Cool room, quiet room, dark room. Avoiding blue light uh, two hours before bed. Your screen time, your phones and your TVs. Uh, taking a warm shower, meditating, using a worry journal at night, just taking notes down, things that are stressing you out, or to-do list. Uh, taking naps is fine if it's early in the day and brief. Avoiding caffeine and fluid uh, at night. These are all things that, uh, that you can do. And they're all free. And that, that's the hard thing is that a lot of improving your sleep is really personal responsibility. And are you willing to, to do the things necessary? Uh, blood pressure is a big one. Uh, this is a particular cuff that I recommend. It's for the large arms. Uh, a lot of folks that I work with, if you use a small cuff, you'll get a, 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 an inaccurate reading. And it's available on Amazon. Uh, you should be testing your blood pressure regularly, especially as a, a large athlete. Uh, and certainly anybody on uh, using performance enhancing drugs uh, should use a blood pressure tester. Here's Dr. Peter Tia talking about blood pressure. Here's some interesting information. So let's talk a little bit about blood pressure. Yeah, so high blood pressure is extraordinarily common in our country. Maybe one-third of adults have high blood pressure. Yeah. How is it defined today? In most places of the world, it's defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. But in this country, uh, recently, it was redefined as being greater than 130 over 80. I mean, you're the nephrologist, so you take care of the organ that is arguably the most sensitive to blood pressure. You could make a case that even more than the heart and the brain the kidney is the first place that damage shows up. Well, there's actually three main sites where high blood pressure really causes problems. And the first one is stroke. It's the major cause of stroke. It's also the major cause of heart failure. And it's one of the two major causes of kidney disease. The higher the pressure, the higher the risk for stroke, heart failure, and kidney disease. There's a tendency for a linear relationship between blood pressure and stroke and blood pressure and heart failure going all the way down to 120 over 80. I can't stress enough how important it is. If you have elevated blood pressure, you need to fix that now. It is a killer. It's an immediate killer. And, and 
beyond its immediate concern for death is its impact on the kidneys. And we all know people who are on dialysis awaiting kidney transplants, uh, who have been in the, 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 fit, the fitness industry of all places. Uh, it, it is something that's important enough to where you should immediately intervene. Some people just, they just put their head in the sand on this deal and it's shocking to me because it is manageable. Uh, the big rocks are obviously weight loss, uh, probably a, a, a millimeter of, of systolic pressure for every two pounds that you lose, uh, and the sleep apnea. Uh, a, a severe sleep apnea resolved with a CPAP can reduce blood pressure by up to 20 points. That's huge. Next on the list, if you're salt sensitive, probably salt limitation, but more importantly in terms of those DASH diet trials, is they implement um, uh, increased potassium intake, fruits and vegetables. And we'll talk a little briefly about how to get that potassium daily. Uh, my high blood, sh high blood sugar or high blood pressure quick fix kit, as mentioned, no smoking or alcohol, lose weight, resolve sleep apnea, uh, take your 10-minute walks after meals, hypothyroidism is a problem, hyperinsulinemia, uric acid, these are all blood tests that you can get, fatty liver, kidney function, I mentioned potassium, vitamin D, magnesium, and calcium, all of those things help. Uh, Low-dose Tadalafil is very effective, it's, uh, it was Cialis, at the, uh, but in low doses it's a vasodilator, increases nitric oxide. Uh, and helps lower blood pressure and then lower sodium for those people who are salt sensitive. Uh, this is Lane Johnson. We started with him. He was 312 pounds. His systolic blood pressure was 152. We actually took him up in weight. I mentioned earlier that not everybody wants to lose weight. Lane needed to be 330 to, to really perform in the NFL. That was his number. Uh, we brought him down to a systolic blood pressure of 131 by put, and put 20 pounds on him in the meantime. Uh, the uh, CPAP was a huge part of that, vitamin D, potassium, calcium, magnesium in his diet was a huge part of that, uh, the post-meal walks, all of that helped. Uh, it also helped reduce his uh, salt sweat rate, although a lot of that is largely genetic. Uh, people sweat out sodium to a different degree, uh, and he worked with Dr. Sandra Godick at the Heat Institute, who does all the sweat testing. Uh, we've done sweat testing for a lot of the athletes that I've worked with, and uh, you try and design rehydration protocols based on the sweat rates. And uh, that was one of the things that actually improved with him uh, as he gained weight and resolved his sleep apnea is he had a lower uh, sweat rate. So some of that was affected by uh, his sleep. Blood pressure medications. I'm always shocked to hear uh, guys who are using performance-enhancing drugs talk about, oh, I'm not going on blood pressure medication. It's like, really? You know, you're shotgunning every, every performance-enhancing drug on the planet and made in somebody's bathroom for... 20 years and you won't use blood pressure medication. It's laughable. Uh, telmostartin, a fantastic uh, medication, very effective, very few side effects in terms of, uh, of fatigue and, and the like, and it may have metabolic uh, health benefits uh, as well as nabivalol or propanol, pro propranol, I'm not even going to say it. Try it 10 times fast. Uh, and some of, these, uh, some of these medications may help with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, so they are of benefit. And you can start a medication uh, like telmosartan, implement all of the high blood pressure quick fix kit uh, lifestyle uh, 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 techniques, and then go off the medication later if it's under control. That's certainly an option, but it should be gotten under control right away. And telmosartan is a very affordable medication. I go through Merrick Health. Uh, here's Tadalafil I mentioned earlier, five milligrams a day, increasing nitric oxide and uh, helping with vasodilation and endothelial function. Also helps with BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. As we age, in particular performance enhancing drug users, uh, they get some increased uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Some symptoms of that are um, uh, incomplete evacuation, uh, reduced stream flow, uh, increased frequency, uh, increased uh, a sense of urgency, waking up periodically throughout the night, those kinds of things. If that, that could be evidence of benign prostatic hyperplasia, Tadalafil is very effective at reducing those symptoms. Uh, libido as well, I mentioned that's another benefit of Tadalafil along with uh, reducing prolactin, which is a common side effect with uh, some performance enhancing drugs. Uh, we take a look at DHEA and pregnenolone and then PT-141 is a derivative of melanotan. Some people have heard about the libido effects of melanotan or PT-141. Uh, it actually acts psychologically on the brain. There's a, um, a medication that was approved by the FDA for women, and its name escapes me right now, but it is PT-141. And it, they charge $1,000 a month for this medication for women. Uh, and as an aside, the, they recommend a milligram dose, which causes uh, nausea and, and women throw up. I don't know if that's the most appealing thing in terms of, of libido enhancement. Uh, so we recommend a much smaller dose consistently rather than just a shot uh, two hours before you, you'd uh, like to engage in 
uh, any kind of sexual behavior, but um, it, it's unfortunate that it's $1,000 a month because we all know that, that PT-141 is sold on peptide sites for 30 bucks. So uh, I, I do have blood work that I do for all of my clients. I recommend that they do this. Uh, I recommend this at least as a baseline for everyone, including teenagers. And I'll talk a little more about that later because I've worked with a lot of them. Um, uh, a very comprehensive panel because you just you don't know. A lot of the things we're talking about today, you can't see or feel. Uh, so here's the blood panel that I fortunately was uh, uh, able to run into the folks from Merrick Health. I've done over, well over 100, probably 150 blood tests over the last 20 years. When I was competing, I'd do them almost on a monthly basis. I wanted to see when I was at my worst and when I was at my best, you know, a month before competition, the day after competition. Uh, they commonly do this at the Arnold. I, I saw the blood tests for uh, Brian Shaw and, and, uh, and uh, Hofthor Bjornsson. Uh, can you imagine the day after deadlifting 1,000 pounds, what that looks like, your creatinine kinase looks like? It, it was horrendous, but you, you, you kind of want to see it. Uh, so I put together a very comprehensive profile. I used to pay almost 300 bucks for this same profile through uh, uh, LabCorp directly. These guys somehow, I don't know, they get it for a much affordable, more affordable price. But at standefforting.com, scroll down, hit blood test. It gives you the instructions. You can get this extraordinary uh, comprehensive panel online. They email you a form. You print it out, take it to LabCorp, and three days later, you get a, a, all your results uh, for 140 bucks. So I'm lowering the barrier to entry because cost seems to be a, uh, a reason why a lot of people don't get blood tests, but they should. So we'll talk about some of those blood tests. This is a common panel. This is a CBC. Uh, and a lot of things we look at with the athletes is the, the red blood cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Sometimes that'll elevate with testosterone use. It'll elevate if you live in Denver. Uh, there's you know, a host of reasons why it might elevate. It's not always a bad thing. Um, we don't want to over-donate in order to keep those numbers down, but it's very common. Uh, so that's one of the labs that's in there. Uh, this is Dr. Neil, Neil Ruzier talking about the difference between polycythemia and erythrocytosis, one being thick blood, the other one being the oxygenation level of the blood. You can't make a determination based just on hemoglobin and hematocrit as to whether or not you have thick blood or increased cardiovascular disease. Uh, he suggests that you look at the platelets, that'll give you a better indicator of thick blood, and ferritin, whether or not you actually do have high iron. The reason I mention this is because I myself and many athletes over the years who reach out to me have over-donated, trying to reconcile the hemoglobin and hematocrit numbers into the normal range and ended up giving themselves anemia. And that'll obviously cause a lot of fatigue. I'll skip over, okay. skip over his talk, it's kind of boring. Uh, comprehensive metabolic panel, we go on here. We got your uh, blood sugars, your glucose. Uh, I mentioned creatinine. Um, uh, that is often affected and elevated just from lifting weights. If uh, when you lift weights uh, or even take a, a 10K jog the day before a blood test, you're gonna see elevated creatinine. It's not necessarily an indicator that you have kidney problems. That's myoglobin being released from the muscle tissue breakdown into the bloodstream. Uh, and so a lot of general practitioners will get alarmed and be like, oh my God, your creatinine's elevated. Uh, well, I worked out yesterday, and that's the reason why. Uh, it's not necessarily a problem. Usually if, if you uh, suspect uh, kidney problems, then you'd want to get a cystatin C. That's a test that'll give you a more specific indication of kidney health. Um, keep on going down here at the bottom. We've got AST, ALT. Those are your liver enzymes. We take, keep a close look on those as well. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, strategies here. I just talked about creatinine. Uh, for your kidneys, obviously staying hydrated is very important. Uh, managing your blood pressure, very important. Your creatinine levels can be in, in, increased just due to increased muscle mass or creatinine consumption and not necessarily due to uh, a poor kidney function. Uh, and I mentioned the, pre the preferred biomarker would be a cystatin C test for, for kidney function. Very important because kidneys, I mean, there is some research suggesting they can regenerate, but it's nothing like the liver. I mean, once the kidneys start going south, that's a problem. Let's stay in front of it with uh, control of blood pressure and, and proper hydration. Uh, this is uh, the liver. I mentioned AST and ALT. Uh, people suffer as they, it's primarily from weight gain. It's over, uh, it's exceeding your body's uh, fat. Um, storage capability, which is different for different people. Some people store fat, women in particular, in the hips and the glutes, and uh, whereas men might store fat, uh, central adiposity, what we call visceral fat, around the organs, and that is a particularly uh, damaging kind of fat to store. Women who go through menopause start to see a change in where their fat is stored. Uh, their estrogen levels will drop, uh, and that becomes kind of alarming to them, and they end up suffering from some of these same problems that, of fatty liver that they historically may not have been exposed to. 
And so uh, usually they need to go in and, and seek therapy and get estrogen therapy uh, in order to, to change their body composition. Uh, the number one thing for fatty liver is weight loss. 7% uh, weight loss reduces 95% of fatty liver. One of the first things I did with Hofthor years ago when I worked with him, he was 440 pounds. I brought him down to 395. We had some indications of metabolic syndrome, obviously, in his blood tests at 440. Uh, and so we brought him down to 395. I like to advise large athletes to periodize their weight just like they periodize their training. You can't train at you know, 100% loads all year round. You shouldn't stay at 100% of, of your largest weight all year round. And so we take the opportunity to water the horse, as I say. Uh, we were able to bring uh, Hofthor's weight down, uh, remedied a lot of the problems that he was experiencing, and then took him back up. But when we took him back up, we used a lot of the, uh, the CPAP, the vitamin D, the lower saturated fat diet, the 10-minute walks, a little increase in fiber intake. And he was able to put weight back on without having the same, as significant of the adverse effects from the weight gain. And he got back up to 440, and his, his numbers looked a lot better. Some other things you can do, I mentioned here, reducing saturated fats, reducing blood sugars. Uh, choline is pretty important. We get those from egg yolks, or you can supplement it, about 1,000 milligrams a day, usually in divided doses. B12 and folate also help with uh, liver regeneration. Uh, some people use injectable glutathione can help. NAC brings your AST and ALT down. Tudka brings your AST and ALT down. Uh, that uh, helps with inflammation in the liver, helps some of the bile uh, get out of the liver. And then polyphenols, citrus flavonoids. Some of you have watched my Iceland seminar years ago when I was raving about the benefits of orange juice, and people were somewhat skeptical. Look, a lot of what I learned, I came to the science later. It was just from experience. Um, taking oral uh, performance-enhancing drugs for powerlifting, Dianabol, Anadrol, I noticed in myself and in my athletes that they would uh, lose their appetite almost immediately. And that's in your AST, ALT, will go, your liver senses the toxin and then shuts down your appetite because it thinks you're feeding it poison. Uh, and that's very common. And one of the ways we were able to remedy that is with orange juice, of all things. And so I would titrate that like medicine, as I talked about in the seminar. Just three or four ounces a few times a day really restored my appetite, uh, along with taking NAC and Tudka. And some people squawked about orange juice. It's no different than sugar. We have plenty of research to suggest it's actually much better because of the polyphenols and the citrus flavonoids. Uh, it neutralizes pro-inflammatory effect of a high-fat, high-carbohydrate high meal um, and uh, prevents endotoxin increase. Orange juice, uh, despite its sugar content, regular consumption of large amounts of OJ do not increase the risk of gout, but may even contribute to lower uric acid levels. Um, orange juice effectively lowers cholesterol levels. Uh, orange juice uh, lowers C-reactive protein and parameters of oxidative stress and lowers AST and, and, uh, and a decrease in those who had high levels before the intervention. So I'm not suggesting it's magic. You know, everybody go out and drink orange juice like it's going to, you know, like it's going to change everything. But it is beneficial. It does help with appetite. It does improve your, your markers. Uh, fruit in general, I'm a huge proponent of that, as we'll talk later in terms of its potassium benefits as well. Uh, on, to, on with the uh, urinalysis here, uh, the lipid panel. One of the biggest things we want to focus on uh, is LDL, or more specifically, ApoB. Apolipoprotein B is the, uh, the protein that's attached to LDL that actually causes uh, cholesterol to be deposited into the arteries. I used to not believe this so much, and I'm, a, and I'm in good company there, um, but mainly because it's kind of an S-shaped curve, uh, we call a sigmoidal curve, where low saturated fat consumption, anywhere between 4 and, say, 12%, you don't see much difference in terms of cardiovascular disease risk. High saturated fat consumption between, let's say, 20 and 26%, you don't see much difference in terms of cardiovascular disease risk. So if all you're doing is looking at those segments of the population, you're going to proclaim that saturated fat does not have uh, any significant effect on cardiovascular disease risk. It's the area in between that, that most of the low-carb community and the LDL denialists seem to avoid when they're looking at, at all the studies in general. Uh, and the area in between is significant. Uh, and so as long as you keep your saturated fat below 10%, uh, then you should not experience the, uh, the adverse effects of LDL. Having said that, it's largely genetically determined. And Dr. Lane Norton, a lifetime natty, uh, he and me both, right? Uh, 60 grams of, of fiber a day, 
He couldn't get his LDL below 130. He started a dual therapy of ezetimibe and uh, a low-dose um, statin. So it can be hypercholesterolemia as a genetic predisposition. Uh, but I would encourage, and this is the problem with LDL, is, is it's the long-term uh, effect. It's 20, 30 plus years before you see the adverse effects of it. And so next to blood pressure, this is probably the second most important thing I focus on in terms of biomarkers with my clients in order for them to improve uh, their long-term uh, all-cause mortality risk. Total cholesterol probably means very little. LDL cholesterol is, and ApoB in particular, an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. If you have low triglycerides and don't smoke uh, and, have, uh, and, and don't drink um, and have you know, higher HDLs, uh, uh, yeah, you're going to have less risk. But if your LDL is elevated, you still will accumulate soft plaque in the tissues that eventually will cause a problem. Some of the side effects we see over a number of years with, with soft plaque accumulation is uh, problems with the microvasculature, which is first manifested in things like uh, your libido. So people start to get ED. And then they'll go on testosterone therapy, and that'll help the ED situation. And they'll think that it's because of the testosterone, but really the canary in the coal mine was the insulin resistance and the microvascular problems that are from uh, an accumulation of soft plaque. And that will eventually overcome the testosterone, and you'll be right. You were just kicking the can down the road. So it, testosterone's not a solution. It's a temporary intervention that may help some of the symptoms, but it's not fixing the problem. So uh, we focus on LDL, and we get that test, and we, we endeavor to fix that. And if, uh, if you can't do it with lifestyle intervention, which is just decreasing saturated fats, I think I've got it here on the next. Uh, this is just uh, an interview that I thought was extraordinary with the uh, uh, Dr. Tom Dayspring uh, on, uh, on cholesterol in general. It's like a three-part series. Uh, if you want to take a deeper dive into this with an actual lipidologist who spent 40 years in the industry actually doing the research, not some journalist like Nina Ty Colts in the low-carb community that is making a bunch of horseshit claims, uh, LDL is uh, an independent risk factor. And, and again, I, I didn't believe this necessarily because I never recommended a high-saturated fat diet. Uh, I've always been 30% of calories or less from fat has been a part of my macro recommendation. And of those, they should be uh, lean. I talked about top sirloin, 96.4 um, lean beef, uh, egg-egg white blends, those kinds of things, fat-free Greek yogurt. Uh, those are always, I, I've never recommended more than 10% total saturated fat intake. Uh, but I still didn't think that, that saturated fat was... I thought it was actually good for performance. We've seen some research in that regard that Menno Henselman has posted on. Uh, but four years ago, Lane Norton didn't think saturated fat matters. Uh, one year ago, uh, examine.com. I think they got 14 PhDs over there. Kamal Patel and his group, they're fantastic. They posted one of those studies that isolated a portion of the, of the, the sigmoidal curve that said that saturated fat didn't matter. So, smarter people than me have made the same mistake. I'm just encouraging you, if you have heard something in the industry, whether it's from Gary Taubes or from Nina Teicholz or the low-carb community, um, Dr. Paul Saladino, you know, the, the uh, what does he say, uh, uh, vegetables will kill you guy. Uh, and I was on his podcast years ago, and I, I talked through a whole lot of this stuff with him, and now he's not keto anymore. He started eating carbohydrates for performance, as we all eventually learn, if we've tried keto, uh, how terrible that is for performance. Uh, all these guys have since. Dr. Peter Atiyah was a big keto guy, intermittent fasting guy. He does neither anymore because he's focused on strength and performance now. And he realizes how important carbohydrates are for that. Uh, almost everybody, um, Dr. Or Mike Mutzel uh, was a, a popular social media influencer whose uh, podcast I was on years ago. He was a keto intermittent fasting guy. Nobody ever got bigger or stronger by not eating. So I never understood the intermittent fasting thing, to be honest with you, especially the, the multiple days of not eating. Uh, the International Society of Sports Nutrition recommends three, possibly four plus uh, evenly spaced feedings of protein daily to optimize performance. And that's what we're all here for. It's not necessarily just weight loss. We have a performance goal. I think we're all athletes inside, uh, even if we're not competing in something. Uh, so I digress. We'll continue. Reduce saturated fat. Get rid of butter, bacon, coconut oil. Uh, Obviously not smoking alcohol, age-related, uh, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, hypothyroidism. If your TSH is above 2, it's going to have an adverse effect on your lipids. Your LDL will elevate as a result of, of, a, high, of a low thyroid. High TSH means low thyroid. 
Uh, and you have to get that remedied first. It has to do with cholesterol clearance. And so that's the first thing you should be focusing on if, uh, if you come back and have a, a thyroid challenge. Uh, I mentioned lifestyle is losing weight, reducing saturated fats, increasing monounsaturated, increasing soluble fiber, and exercising. The medications are very effective. Azetamibe uh, is one that's not even a statin. So 10 milligram acetamide will help with uh, uh, resisting the amount of cholesterol that you uptake. A low-dose statin will help increase uh, cholesterol clearance. And sometimes they use the dual therapy together. Extremely effective. Uh, many years ago, I used to not recommend statins because they were high-dose monotherapy. And I would see a lot of myalgia. I would see patients coming to me saying, oh, my muscles are sore, or hurt, or tired, I'm not recovering. Uh, Any more of these therapies, in, in dual therapies with low-dose, are very effective with uh, almost no side effects. Uh, we keep going here, iron, testosterone, HA1C, these are all tests. Um, I run into a lot of problems with iron, particularly with women. The female triad, I work with a lot of uh, female athletes in a, in a variety of different sports, as you saw earlier. Um, and, and the female triad is, is chronic calorie restriction, what we call low energy availability. Amenorrhea, cessation of the menstrual period, which as I mentioned earlier, in terms of, uh, uh, of menopause, it affects estrogen. Uh, to such a degree that it, it actually uh, will increase um, calcium loss and, and bone mineral density, uh, and hence ending up with osteoporosis. And you see young uh, female athletes in college in particular, the distance runners, uh, they end up with shin splints uh, as a result of, of a combination of these problems just from under eating. Um, anemia is another thing, low iron. Uh, I, I see this in high schools and colleges now. Uh, for some reason, young women uh, will avoid a whole host of foods that, they've, that have been demonized in social media, red meat, uh, egg yolks, uh, milk, dairy of any kind, fruit. Uh, God forbid that somebody would eat fruit and their insulin would spike and they wouldn't be able to lose weight. It's just the craziest stuff that's going to Dr. Jason Fung's uh, insulin heart hypothesis nonsense. Uh, you can see I get a little emotional about it. It's frustrating to see because it has an impact, a very severe health impact on young athletes in particular who were influenced by this information. And so uh, I was working with a, a women's softball team in Arizona, uh, a high school softball team last summer, and two of the parents came to me and said their kid's performance had declined significantly. We would test their 40s uh, with a laser timer and see that they had actually decreased in, in speed over the course of the, the months that we had been working with the team, sent them in for a blood test, uh, anemia. Very common, probably one of the, the most Significant and common impacts is low iron with these uh, because of the dietary choices and the overtraining, most certainly. Uh, hair loss, bone mineral loss, we talked about all of that. So the remedy for that, obviously, is to, to give them some education. If I want to raise iron in an athlete, particularly a female athlete, uh, I consume uh, a heme iron like red meat with a non-heme iron like spinach and vitamin C. It seems to help uh, accelerate absorption and uptake of the iron. And I avoid calcium in that particular meal because it binds to iron. So I'll set them up on a four-meal day. I'll have two high iron meals with no calcium. And then the other two meals will be dairy and eggs. It'll be yogurt and, and, and eggs. So I can get them sufficient protein from a variety of sources uh, and increase their iron intake. Some may need to supplement. Uh, it, it can take a time. It can take a couple, three months to get their ferritin levels back up. Uh, but they'll see almost an immediate improvement just in their general energy and performance within just a couple of weeks. Some men need to lower their iron. Donating blood is one solution for that. I'm um, cautious not to over-donate, as mentioned earlier, because you can give yourself anemia. Uh, or just consume dairy with meals. This is something that um, uh, Dr. Chris Masterjohn, PhD Nutrition, does. He's got, uh, he's got high iron, uh, genetically predisposition for high iron, uh, and he'll... Uh, take a lot of calcium with his meals to bind to the iron. That, that seems to be helped. Yogurt with his red meat. But he likes to continue to eat red meat because of all the other benefits that it provides. Uh, the B12, the carnitine, and, and choline, and um, L-carnosine, all the uh, creatine. Uh, high blood sugar is another big problem that I run into with, uh, with a lot of uh, individuals uh, generally who, who are carrying too much body mass. Fasted glucose and HA1C are lagging indicators. When you see those on your blood test and they look normal, those can stay normal for a decade or two while you have insulin resistance, which is seen with high triglycerides and high fasted insulin. You want to keep those triglycerides under 100? You want to keep that fasted insulin hopefully under 6? The normal range is up to like 22 or 24, uh, but that's way too high. Those are the leading indicators that you have some insulin resistance. So those are the numbers that I look at more closely. 
uh, than the fasted glucose and HA1C. Uh, the fix for high blood sugar, obviously losing weight. I mentioned 7% weight loss. 15% weight loss may restore beta cell, pancreatic beta cell function, uh, even for people who are insulin-dependent type 2 diabetics. They may actually get a restoration depending on how long they were, they were diabetic. Uh, liquid diets, actually a low-calorie diet seems to reverse type 2 diabetes the fastest, uh, but long-term sustainable weight loss is the most significant uh, intervention. Improving sleep, 10-minute walks after meals, increasing your protein intake, eating protein first uh, helps mitigate postprandial glycemia, the, the blood sugar spikes in duration after a meal. Uh, thyroid function has an impact as well as potassium, magnesium, and vitamin D, so all those things count. How am I doing on time? I couldn't see it on the wall up here. About 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, here we've got estrogen, uh, TSH. I mentioned a, a high TSH can have effect on cholesterol. PSA, your prostate-specific antigen, these are all things that are in this very comprehensive blood test. Vitamin D, I did a, a rant on vitamin D when I was deficient, has a whole host of, uh, of adverse effects on sleep and blood sugar regulation and energy, uh, so that's something to pay attention to on the test. I mentioned hypothyroidism can slow metabolism, raise blood pressure, raise cholesterol, uh, can cause goiter, impair digestion, suppress your immune system, and cause fatigue. Uh, the biggest problems with hypothyroidism is usually undersleeping, uh, overtraining, and then lack of iodine. And here's Dr. Chris Masters on PhD to talk about uh, iodine, but also listen to the symptoms associated with low thyroid at the end of the video. Things that could be making you iodine deficient. Iodized salt was the public health campaign that eradicated severe iodine deficiency. A lot of people restrict their salt intake. If you do, you could be eliminating one of your key sources of iodine. You may have switched from iodized salt to something like Celtic sea salt or pink Himalayan salt, but they're not good sources of iodine. You could have increased your intake of foods that have compounds that inhibit the uptake of iodine into your thyroid gland. The most common example of this is large amounts of cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kale and cauliflower. If your cholesterol is running high, or if you feel fatigued, or you feel brain fog, or your hair is falling out, or you're getting puffy underneath the eyes, or cold hands and feet, you could be symptoms of hypothyroidism. And so if those are happening, you need more iodine in your diet. Pretty common symptoms. I mean, you might recognize those for yourself or from one of your clients. Uh, it's important to say that we're not demonizing food here. When you said broccoli or kale, or uh, dose matters. I'll talk a little bit that, about that later, but I don't, I don't want to make it just a good food, bad food conversation. It's just uh, that it's important to recognize that if some people can eat too much of a particular food and impair uh, hormonal performance. Uh, I've always recommended cranberry juice, very high in iodine. Just a few ounces has about 300% of the daily RDA. Daily RDA is 125 micrograms. Um, uh, using some iodized salt, a little bit of cranberry juice, can get you, you know, three, four times the daily RDA, which may be necessary for athletes. You sweat out iodine. So it's important to replace that as well. Uh, here we've got C-reactive protein as an inflammation marker. I mentioned uh, insulin earlier and where that should be reading. Somewhere under six is what I prefer. Ferritin is your stored iron. As that starts to get down to below 100, or certainly by the time you get to 40, you're, you're anemic. Uh, and that's a problem. Keep an eye on that for those who are over-donating. ApoB, uh, I mentioned that should stay under 100, ideally 80 or below if you want to stop the progression of cardiovascular disease and soft uh, and, and uh, uh, plaque formation. I mentioned potassium. This is the, the foundation of the vertical diet is to first eat the foods that are high in potassium. It decreases blood pressure and stroke risk, regulates heartbeat, improves blood sugars and sugar cravings and constipation. It's hard to get 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. You have to be deliberate about it. And so in all the diets that I do, the foundation of the diet, they have a daily potato, they have some fruit, and they have yogurt. And that pretty much satisfies the requirement. I do have the spinach OJ shake. And those are mostly, the foundation of that is mostly potassium consumption. Uh, and so there it is, what, what I recommend in a day to get your 4,700 milligrams. Uh, I don't get to white rice until all of this is satisfied and until an athlete has a, a, a workload demand or a, a calorie demand that, uh, that needs additional uh, carbohydrates. And then I just utilize that because it's easy to digest and to fuel uh, these huge uh, athletes and, and uh, daily double training kind of uh, requirements. We supplement magnesium, about 400 milligrams with dinner. It's hard to get from food. We supplement vitamin D, uh, as most people recommend, 2,000 to 4,000 I use a day, generally speaking, is, is a good dose. Um, I run across a lot of athletes with digestive disorders uh, on both ends of the spectrum, chronic dieters uh, ending up with IBS, and then people who overeat with a, a host of different problems, uh, GERD and, and uh, diarrhea, et cetera. 
Uh, if you suffer from these uh, problems, an elimination diet is generally recommended as an initial intervention. Uh, the most popularized um, and most uh, researched is out of Monash University. It's the low FODMAP diet. And any of you have heard me talk about this over the years. Uh, these fermentable oligodiamonosaccharides and polyols can increase um, gas in the stomach and cause some uh, aggravation of the IBS. Implementing a low FODMAP diet seems to resolve about 60 to 80 percent of symptoms for the vast majority of users. The important thing here is that we reintroduce after you've seen uh, a relief in the symptoms. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's individualistic. Not everybody suffers from these problems. Not everybody has to eat a low FODMAP diet. Uh, it's dose dependent, how much of these things you eat uh, matters. It's uh, how it's prepared. A, a, a cook broccoli till it's soft. Uh, it has less uh, uh, FODMAPs than if you uh, eat it raw. Uh, and then it's cumulative in nature. Some of you may have seen my video, uh, Sugar Alcohols and Sharding Your Pants, uh, where I was talking about, uh, what was that, that Halo Top. Uh, it's a low calorie ice cream because they substitute the sugar with sugar alcohols, which are indigestible. So next thing you know, you run to the toilet with diarrhea. I see this commonly when I go to the Arnold Classic or the Olympia and people run around eating peanut butter balls and a whole assortment of really tasty stuff that's low calorie. And then there's that line at the bathroom and people are really uncomfortably standing out there. and They, they, they just ate too many sugar alcohols and you commonly see this. When I was on Tom Bilyeu's podcast, I didn't call him out on this, but Quest Bar is famous for loading and full of sugar alcohols. Even gum. If some people find some indigestion from, from chewing gum, it's commonly the sugar alcohols. You may be sensitive to those. They're indigestible and they can cause diarrhea. So here's the foods that contain FODMAPs and the ones that are low in FODMAP. You can Google this. I, I don't need to go into it in detail. Uh, a lot of people say it's restrictive. Uh, I think it's pretty selective. There's over 100 items. Uh, you can get high fiber, low FODMAP foods, uh, one of which is included is uh, psyllium husk as a supplement. Uh, if you choose to do that to help increase your fiber intake and help with your cholesterol levels, uh, your LDL levels, you may just use a little bit of psyllium husk. Fair warning, don't use a lot of psyllium husk. It's something you want to start very slow and steady on. Uh, you'll have some problems. Uh, but uh, there's lots of foods in, in the, the, uh, the FODMAP diet, over 100 to choose from. Acid reflux is a big problem, especially with a lot of my big athletes. I have to get you to eliminate antacids as soon as possible. Some people are on these these, uh, these uh, PPIs, protein pump inhibitors, for years. And it inhibits protein breakdown and absorption and mineral breakdown and absorption. So it causes a whole host of, of adverse effects. So we implement a low FODMAP diet and the rest is just, is, is just behavioral. Uh, chew your food better. Eat smaller meals, eat your protein first because it stimulates hydrochloric acid. And then when your carbs come in, those can get broken down more efficiently. Reduce the amount of fluid you drink with a meal. Uh, consume bone broth with meals, tends to be good for the lining of the stomach. Taking 10 minute walks after meals helps with um, uh, that post meal uh, potential acid reflux. Elevating the head of your bed, not laying down after meals. Some people may need betaine HCL supplements because they don't have enough hydrochloric acid to properly digest the food uh, and reducing caffeine intake. Uh, weakness is never a strength. A brilliant philosopher once said this and I've never forgotten it. I've used this throughout my career to determine if what I was doing uh, was, was beneficial or harmful. Um, actually, it was Mark Bell that said it. Not a brilliant philosopher, but even a broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, love Mark, good buddy. Uh, weakness is never a strength. So I came up with my list of things that make you weak, things that I encourage my athletes not to do on a regular basis, so taking antiacids, antiestrogens, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, uh, if needed, yeah, but don't. People are always grabbing Z-packs when they get a cold. Next thing you know, they're wiping out their gut microbiome and then they can't digest foods very well and it uh, limits the, the variety that they can eat. Donating blood too often, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, taking diuretics, metformin's on the list. I used to have statins on this list some years ago, as mentioned, because the high doses would cause myalgia, but uh, now the recommendations are such that it doesn't seem to cause the problem. People question metformin. A lot of people are like, metformin, that's an insulin metamedic or whatever they call it. Uh, metformin has a whole host of problems. It uh, reduces, um, here it says the lifestyle intervention. This was comparing metformin to exercise. Uh, 10 minute walks after meals is twice as effective as, met as metformin for reducing blood sugars. Uh, this here is the effect of uh, this same study, diabetes prevention and the outcome study. Uh, here it was for longevity. There's no Longevity, the longevity industry is, is, is tough. It's rife with, with uh, uh, just made up stuff. It's, it's terrible. 
There, there's very few, or if any, long-term randomized controlled trials demonstrating any benefit to most of the things that Dr. Walter Longo and, and, and Huberman and Rhonda Patrick and, and Peter Atia and I love them all, watch their stuff. They write about a lot of stuff. They're smarter than me. But these, these, they talk about these mechanisms of action, and they take these giant logical leaps into these outcome, 50% you know, you know, improvement in lifespan. None of that is proven in human trials. Most of what they traffic in is, is not meaningful, to be honest. And here's your longest randomized controlled trial on metformin. It doesn't provide any life extension benefit as compared to placebo. Uh, also, it inhibits mitochondrial adaptations to aerobic exercise. Uh, it decreases the response to progressive resistance training. Um, here's Dr. Peter Tia himself. I watched for years as people like, uh, uh, names escaping me now, but they would all come on Joe Rogan and talk about their supplement protocol, whether it was NMN or resveratrol or uh, you know, metformin. And I'm patient. I've been in this business for 30 years. I've tried all this stupid stuff. I've learned lessons myself m many times, multiple times over. Uh, and I just wait, and sure enough, two years later, three years later, all these guys come around, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, that didn't work. They said it about keto, they said it about intermittent fasting, they said it about metformin. So my take on metformin has changed dramatically over the past year, so I think there have been a number of studies, along with my own personal observations, experimenting with myself and patients, that lead me to believe that metformin is probably still a wonderful agent for the insulin-resistant patient, the patient with type 2 diabetes. I think it is a suboptimal and probably harmful tool in the insulin sensitive, highly metabolically tuned patient. I think it is actually blunting the benefits of exercise. You know, I took metformin for probably eight years and I stopped it. I, the reason I stopped it was not because of this trial. I stopped it long before this trial, but I stopped it on the basis of what I was seeing in terms of my mitochondrial efficiency uh, doing this uh, very particular type of lactate based training. I tried it for two weeks and figured out it wasn't good. 15 years ago, I reached out to Dave Palumbo. I'm like, Dave, I. I Weakness is never a strength. If you go to the gym, it's a wonderful thing about weightlifting. It's immediate feedback. If you go to the gym and your performance is significantly less than it was three days ago or a week ago, something happened in that three days or a week. And it's, that's what's so wonderful about it. You can make an immediate adjustment. Did I lose sleep? Did I miss a meal? Did I, was I not properly hydrated? Uh, did I take metformin? Uh, and that's what I experienced, and that's what I, athletes started reaching out to me. Damn, I'm getting weak. And it was either anti-estrogens or metformin, over and over and over again. Or they were brewing their own stuff and, and not filtering it and ending up with infections. So <laughs> those are the big three. 10-minute uh, walks. You guys have heard me talk about these. I can't talk enough about these. If you see uh, Hofthor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw taking 10-minute walks and Lane Johnson taking 10-minute walks, these are for everybody. Okay, uh, take these after each meal. Uh, they're sustainable. Uh, they're huge for improving insulin sensitivity. I mentioned twice as effective as metformin for reversing or preventing type 2 diabetes. They manage what everybody's all stressed out about now, postprandial glycemia. Everybody's wearing their continuous glucose monitors because they're worried about blood sugar spikes, which is normal, by the way. It's not until you get up north, significantly north of 140 uh, that you need to be concerned about blood sugar, and that's for insulin-resistant uh, people. Generally, the, the healthy population, those fluctuations are quite normal and not to be anything that you need to, to blunt uh, with a, any particular intervention. But insulin sensitivity has improved, decreasing gas. Mark Bell says releasing gas. Either way, you don't bring it home with you. Improves digestion, satiety, aids in recovery. Three 10-minute walks a day is better than one 30-minute bout of exercise at the end of the day. And they've looked at these studies in terms of sedentary office workers versus those who move around more. Uh, we like these periodic... Uh, movement. And I think that's it. That's a wrap. Did I make time? Okay. Sorry, my friends say I water the lawn with a fire hose. So I know it was a lot of information at, at once, but I, I think it's all important. I want to make sure that everybody at least was able to take something out of this and put it in their toolbox uh, and, and be able to get some benefit from for themselves or for their clients. So I really appreciate you guys being here. I'm not sure if there's time for questions or uh, how soon the next presenter is coming. I'll be around all weekend. You guys feel free to, to come up and uh, and, and ask me anything you want to ask me. And again, I, I'm not up here trying to be right necessarily. I, I try and reference the people who are professionals in the industry. Uh, if you've heard something different or feel something different, I, I welcome the engagement. This is, this is my life. I, I study this stuff constantly uh, to make sure that I'm giving good information to people. And if you feel like there's something that disagrees with your current, uh, your, your current uh, understanding of the topic, please come, come talk to me. And even if it's a contrarian view, I, I, you know, I welcome that conversation so we're all learning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's not a question. 
Right in the back here. There's a stop bang questionnaire that you can Google on that, that, that gives you kind of a test, a little check box you, you can add up. If you're snoring and waking up tired, it's a pretty good indication that you have some degree of apnea. Obviously, the, the gold standard is to go in and get a, a sleep study done. Uh, a more affordable option might be those uh, uh, blood oxygenation uh, meters for, that, that can tie to a phone so you can see the periodic measurements throughout the night. If you're consistently hitting you know, less than 90, 92% uh, blood oxygen rate, there's probably a good chance you're holding your breath throughout the night, uh, and that might warrant uh, a CPAP intervention. And I encourage people to use the medical professional for that. Not everybody can afford it, uh, in which case it's important enough in this instance to self-medicate. It, it, it's that effective and it has it, it is that safe which is what's most important i would never suspect you know suggest someone use some random medical intervention uh, without supervision but this is is pretty innocuous and very beneficial stop bang questionnaire shoot Boy, I hate this conversation. I, I was a wrestler in high school. I cut. I was 98 pounds as a freshman and sophomore, 106 as a junior, 115 as a senior. Constantly cutting weight, constantly restricting calories. I think it. I had, as a result, I had delayed onset puberty. Uh, I was a senior in high school before I went through puberty, and I was only 135 pounds as a freshman in college when I was 18. Uh, I, my brother is, is two inches taller than me and was 50 pounds heavier. Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of instances like this, you know, Sean Ray and his brother, very different sized individuals. So genetically speaking, I, uh, I, I might have done some harm to myself. And I hate seeing that constant dieting. Uh, so yeah, I would like to see, uh, I'd like to see athletes like Eddie Cohn, you know, he started out at what, 165 pounds and worked up to 220, 230 throughout his career. I, I'd like to see athletes not... S uh, in an unhealthy way, over restrict, just like the women in the female triad, men, uh, if you don't have sufficient calories and sufficient sleep, you can delay the hormonal response necessary to go through your normal uh, puberty cycle. So yeah, I, I, I hate the weight cutting for teenagers. I really, really do. Uh, you know, I would use some of these biomarkers as an indication and try and find out if it's, you know, you kind of have to go with uh, how you're feeling. Uh, you can look at iron deficiency, those kinds of things. But uh, I would like to, we, cutting, getting to a really low body fat, obviously we, we understand it has significant adverse effects on hormone levels and, and energy and uh, even, even cutting fats too low in the diet can have some of the same effect. Uh, so you can't stay there forever. And so, yeah, I would in, encourage folks. Everybody has a different set point too. Some people can be relatively functional at 12%, and other people just can't even move at 12% body fat. It's, it's, it's very different. Oh. Shoot. Uh, alternative sources of citric blood oxide, besides like OJ? Any fruit. Yeah, I like the low sugar fruits, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, oranges, those kinds of things. Uh, but there, fruit's fantastic. You couldn't, can't say enough about it in terms of potassium benefits and what it seems to be the anti-inflammatory benefits. What really neat uh, on a lot of the research is if you are consuming a high uh, saturated fat diet, you do see generally any meal of significant calories is going to cause some inflammation. A lot of that seems to be uh, uh, mitigated with the, uh, the fruit intake. You see a little less of that acute inflammation post-meal. So I'm a big fan of eating fruits and, and dairy. Dairy in particular, I have to say, fantastic if you can tolerate it. Some people have um, uh, dairy allergy, in which case, you know, don't consume dairy. But dairy intolerance is very, uh, quite significantly amongst individuals, how much you can take at any given time. And intolerance isn't a bad thing. Uh, and it might just be that you haven't consumed it so long that your lactase enzyme has downregulated and you need to start titrating small doses to upregulate up your lactase enzyme. But dairy in particular obviously increases IGF-1. Uh, it has a certain type of fat, a milk fat globulin membrane that does not contribute to elevated LDLs. Uh, that's true of milk. That's true of hard cheeses like cheddar. It's not true of butter. 
Once you churn that dairy into butter, you lose the calcium and you lose uh, that milk fat globulin in your brain, and that will increase LDL. Uh, I think dairy is a fantastic food for those who can tolerate it in whatever dose they can tolerate, particularly yogurt. The um, Sonnenberg trials out of Stanford showed that uh, when they used fiber interventions uh, in their effect on the gut microbiome, uh, one third of people had a significantly improved response, one third of people had no response, another third of people had a poor response. But with fermented foods, such as, as yogurt in particular, all of them showed an increase in biodiversity uh, and quantity. And so uh, I, I, I go to those foods first. I think kimchi qualifies in that group of fermented foods, uh, hard cheddar cheese, fermented foods, yogurt. I'm a big fan of consuming a lot of yogurt every day. You need 1,000 milligrams of calcium anyhow, and that's three servings of dairy. That's a lot. And so I've, I've got it peppered throughout my recommendations, for certainly for all my athletes, but for general health, for digestion, and all of that, I think that uh, yogurt's a great one. All right, guys. Hey, I got to. There we go. Yeah, we, take, right. we can do questions later for sure. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Stan. You.